So, maybe we should get into it, and it's not pleasant. The, the, the final steps of the proof of the Hanbanic theorem. So let's just go ahead and do it and then give it an example. Hopefully that will clear it up a little bit. <clears throat> so we're working on pages, uh, working on, uh, it's just the same, I'm just trying to explain the proof here on the, um, page 216, part C. <clears throat> so let's do that. So how is CSAP's going? <laughs> you know, um, I need some mental stimulation. <laughs> well, we had uh, with the student newspaper at East High School. They have something called the rear end, and I didn't know what the rear end meant. Rear end meant that they can make all kinds of jokes and false statements as much as they want. <laughs> and so there was this article in CSAP. Says, oh, the you know the board decided to forego CSAP this year, and hallelujah, and it's you know great idea. And we can't believe that they actually did this. And I thought, wow, this is for real. Instead, the last two weeks has just been like no classes, and they go from 1:30 to 3 o'clock or 2:45 or something like that. Yeah, I mean, it's just crazy. It's just like, what? Why even go to school? And then they can have spring break after that. So for three weeks, nothing. Yeah, yeah. basically, we've been talking the entire month of March. Yeah. I, I haven't been able to teach much during March. It's insane. Now, That's crazy. AP stat students I've seen three times this month. Yeah. When did you start them? What, CSAP? Yeah. Early this week. Yeah. But we also had the end of the quarter, so we had a day off there. Yeah. Plus, we have. Um, spring break coming up. Yeah, thank you. I don't know why they focus so much on those, but that seems to be the. It's a time consuming thing. Han Bonnock. Theorem, the first one, where we've assumed that X is a real inner product space. First version. X is a real inner product space. And um, and Z in X is a given subspace. F from Z to R a given linear functional um, and let's see uh, P from X to the non-negative reals, a given sublinear functional function. Okay, and assume f of x is less than or equal to p of x for x belonging to z. We have shown so far Using Zorn's lemma, that there exists a linear extension F tilde from the domain of F tilde to the reals um, that such that. Um, F tilde of X is less than or equal to P of X for all um, X in the domain of F tilde and F tilde is maximal so there is no space Y 
Now, one strictly uh, containing but not equal to the domain of F tilde with F tilde of uh, so with and so there so there is no space Y and linear extension uh, G one from Y one to R such that Uh, G1 maps, so it says that G1 of X is less than or equal to P of X for all X in Y1. So we've shown that that can't happen. But now we're going to show um, if if F if D of F tilde is not all of X, that this can happen. <laughs> okay, so we'll have a contradiction. So we we assume. Now, by contradiction, that um, the domain of F tilde, so uh, space Y1, and then of course in it contained in X, because that was the okay business here, all right? So that is not equal to all of X. Okay. Then we construct, then we let little y1 be in capital, uh, excuse me, capital X minus the domain of F tilde. Okay. And construct y, capital Y1 equal to the span of the domain of F tilde and this single element y1. Okay, that's what we've done so far. And now we claim, and then we claim, the claim now, there exists um, and I call this double star. Okay. Now, Y1 obviously does strictly contain the domain of F tilde. Okay. Claim there exists a C in the real numbers so that the definition um, 1, G1 of X, equal to F tilde of Y plus alpha C for any x in y1 with x you written uniquely as y plus alpha y1, y belonging to the domain of f tilde. Okay, and alpha in R. The existence of this definition is a linear extension of f tilde that satisfies. With your extension here of f or f tilde, <coughs> that satisfies double star. Okay, so that will be a contradiction, therefore, of the maximality of f tilde, and therefore we will conclude that the domain of f tilde is all of X, and we'll have the statement that we want for the Hanbonic there. So we did all of this last time. <laughs> okay, we. It's mentioned all these steps and verified that indeed by using Zorn's lemma that there was this F tilde that was maximal so that we got this non-existent statement. Okay, this non-existent statement and then we say, okay, well, suppose now the domain of F tilde is not equal to X, let's prove that it does exist. Okay, so the key is to find that there exists a C in here and we did a little bit more messing around last time. We said, well, what, if I have this definition one, Okay, for any x where x was given to be y, this was the uh, dis description of the x in w capital Y1. <coughs> but 
was written uniquely this way. We just take this span of a given vector space and then one more element that's not in that vector space, so you can write all elements in the slightly larger vector space this way is a sum of a vector in the old space plus some scalar multiple of the other vector. If we have that situation, then we, we had two necessary conditions then in order for double star to hold. And those will turn out to be, and I want to write them down because we're going to use them in the final state, in the final uh, construction to get double star. So we showed last time necessary for double star. I say the double star can't happen, but now I'm going to say what it is to get it to happen, of course. Do you understand the logic of this? All right, so, so this thing is what I want. So this is my definition. For double, necessary for double star are the following two conditions. Uh, I call them two. It's statement two that C should be less than or equal to P of Y plus Y1 minus F tilde of Y for all Y in the domain of F tilde. And also I had written down that this was necessary, that three, that I had to have minus P of minus Z minus Y1 minus F tilde of Z less than or equal to C for all Z in the domain of F tilde. The way I got these was to take certain values, uh, take alpha equal plus 1 or minus 1. When alpha equals plus 1, I uh, immediately came with this. And then I took uh, Y equal to minus Z, but when I took alpha equal to minus 1, I took a different parameterization of Y, I took Y equal to a minus Z. You get minus signs, more minus signs, <laughs> okay? I wanted two minus signs here, as it turns out, okay? When we want to get, when we want to apply three, okay? Well, this just came straight away from uh, what was by plugging one into double star with this value of x. And specific values of alpha. So I put this x in here, I put that x in there. Okay, so all I did was I take this and I plug it in here and I plug it in here. Okay, then I use this for the left hand side. Okay, and I just leave the right hand side the way it is. And so what would I get? If I took alpha equal to 1, I'd get uh, alpha equal to 1, I get that um, if I take this this business and I get alpha equal to 1. Let me just double check this again. I get G1 of X is F tilde of Y plus C, okay, should be less than or equal to P of X, which is P of Y plus Y1. And that gives then, if I put the transpose and put the F tilde of Y on the other side, it gives me exactly that number 2 up there. Okay, <laughs> just that. Okay, and if I put alpha equals minus one, and y equals okay, um, yeah, I put just put this business on the other side with the minus sign, and I get this one. Okay. So these two things give me that. So that's where we got to last time. Okay, now I want to verify that, that there is a C so that 2 and 3 hold, and that will pretty much give me what I want. How do I verify that there is such a C that 2 and 3 hold? Okay, those were necessary, but they'll also be sufficient for what I want to show. Okay, so now to check that, three, that 2 and 3 will be holding, I'll do the following. Okay. I can now erase this. I'll leave double star in here. <clears throat> Check that there is 
a C so that 2 and 3 hold. Okay. Here it is. What we're going to do is write this. Use linearity of F and sublinearity of P. Okay, and the fact that we already had that, uh, what F was doing. Let's take, so we have Y and Z belonging to the domain of F tilde. All I have to do is check something for Y and Z in the domain of F tilde. And there's this little Y1 sticking around here that has to be dealt with. But P was sublinear on the whole of X, so that maybe that can be handled. Let Y and Z be in D F tilde. I have F tilde of Y minus F tilde of Z equal to F tilde of Y minus Z, which is less or equal to P of Y minus Z by the fact that F tilde already was having the property that we wanted. Y tilde, F tilde is a maximal element so that it actually does have Of, of, all right, so it did have the property that F tilde of anything in the domain of F tilde is less or equal to P of anything in the domain, of the corresponding thing in the domain of F tilde. So Y minus Z is an element of the domain of F tilde. F tilde of X is less than or equal to P of X. X in the domain of F tilde. Let's put it that way. Okay? Okay, so that was the reasoning. But I can do that, inequality. And on the other hand, that's less than or equal to, now I'm going to use the sublinearity. I'm going to write y, well, that's equal to p of y plus y1 um, plus a minus y1 minus z. Okay, so I'll write it this way. Which by subadditivity is less than or equal to p of y plus y1 plus P of minus Y1 minus Z. Okay. So that's sublinearity. Okay. So now rewrite this business. If I put, then I get exactly one of these expressions on one side and one of these expressions on the other side. Let's see. By putting F of Y, uh, let's put the P of Y plus Y1 minus the F tilde of Y on one side and uh, minus P of minus Z minus Y1 and the minus F tilde of Z on the other side. And you get indeed that this is true if and only if, therefore, that minus P of minus Z minus Y1 minus F tilde of Z is less than or equal to <coughs> P of Y plus Y1 minus F tilde of Y. Someone can verify this algebraically <laughs> by putting minuses on various sides. Okay. <clears throat> so, we do have this. This is 4. I guess I'll call this 4. 4 does hold. 4 holds. Therefore, uh, I can take uh, what I have. If I take the soup of these numbers on the left hand side. So, in order to sort of finish this then, put M0, so this holds. This is just a general fact. Alright? Holds true. <clears throat> but, uh, put M0 equal to the supremum of the left-hand side of this 4. So that's the minus P of minus Z minus Y1 minus F tilde of Z. Z belonging to the domain of F tilde. And put M1 equals the infimum of the right-hand side, which is P of Y plus Y1 minus F tilde of Y over Y in the domain of F tilde. Okay, what 4 gives us is that M0 and M1 both exist by 4. M0 and M1 exist, and M0 is less than or equal to M1. Okay, therefore, 
for any C belonging to the closed interval M0 to M1, 2 and 3 both hold. Now let's show that that finishes the job. Now let's use the, we didn't use the uh, positive homogeneity of P yet. So now I'll use the positive homogeneity of P to show that I get this alpha in here that I'm going to get double star. Okay? Okay. And that's just the end of the proof. So, finally, use positive homogeneity of P it follows it follows by 2 let's just take this first one first by 2 and alpha greater than 0 take a real number greater than 0 and Y replaced by one over alpha y, okay, <laughs> that c is less than or equal to p of one over alpha y plus y1 minus f tilde one over alpha y. Okay, now what can I do? And then I can multiply um, I think I made a mistake in the notes, but at some point here, these notes eight. I think I might have skipped a one over alpha somewhere, right here. I think I missed this one over alpha. If you read the notes, there's gonna be some typos in the notes. Uh, so then multiply through by alpha, and what do I get? I get alpha. Alpha is not negative, so I multiply and not change the inequality. When I multiply this side, the the p by alpha, I can bring the alpha inside by positive homogeneity, so I get y plus alpha y1 minus f tilde of y. So I'll get this. So then I get double star for that case. If alpha is positive. Double, therefore, holds if alpha is positive. Okay. With that choice of c. And then finally, uh, if alpha is less than zero, um, use three and z replaced by 1 over alpha y again, okay, that uh, minus p, then 1 over alpha y minus y1, excuse me, uh, I need a minus z replaced by, so this is a minus 1 over alpha y, minus y1, minus f tilde, 1 over alpha y, is less than equal to C. Now multiply through by minus alpha. Multiply by minus alpha. Minus alpha, which is positive. Okay? What happens then? Well, I pull the minus alpha in. Just ignore this minus sign on the outside. Pull the minus sign. Minus alpha is a positive number, so I get to pull it inside. Okay? By positive homogeneity. What do I have? I have P of beta X equals beta PX if beta is greater than zero, greater than or equal to zero. Okay? So I'm gonna, this is going to be my beta. Okay? All right? So just ignore that minus sign there. Take this beta, multiply through by minus alpha and pull it through. And so that I get minus P of Y plus alpha y1. Now with this minus sign, then I will get a plus 
F tilde of Y less than or equal to minus alpha C with the inequalities preserved because minus alpha is negative. <laughs> okay. And I'll put everything on the other sides and I get put this stuff on the other side and put the minus put put everything that's minus on the other side. I obtain magically, I guess. <laughs> okay. That F tilde of Y plus alpha C Again, less than or equal to P of Y plus alpha Y1. Okay. QED. Therefore, G1 exists. Therefore, double star hole. I mean, therefore, double star holds. Contradiction. Therefore, domain of F tilde is all of X. So that we couldn't extend any further. Uh, okay. So double star holds if, if alpha is less than zero. If alpha equal to zero is trivial. Because we already had it holding with F tilde and um, contradiction. QED. So let's have an example. <laughs> That's kind of a simple example just to see sort of what's going on here. It's going to be kind of a trivial example, but we've got to have something to look at. Okay. So, let's see. Let's take our example and see if we can construct for a separable, I think it is for a separable um, bond space. I think you can do everything basically uh, without the Lorentz lemma. Um, I should qualify that, that I might be wrong, but basically, <laughs> um, let's see, what is the actual problem in here? Maybe it actually is a problem uh, in the book. Let me see what it says. There it is. Show that for a separable norm space, well, Bonnach space is a complete norm space, so yes, for a separable norm space, you can prove all this stuff directly without the use of Zorn's lemma. Uh, they actually specify just a specific theorem, but uh, we'll go on. So if we take X, equal to, let's say, real, well, real little L1, and take P of X, simply to be the norm of X, equals C1 plus C2 plus dot, dot, dot for X equals C, the sequence C1, C2, and so on. The usual thing. Let E1 be the standard <coughs> basis vector 1, 0, 0, 0, and so on. E2 equal to 0, 1, 0, zero dot 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 etc and let's take z I need to take z something simple let's see, take the span of the first vector e1 and let's take f of f of anything I think I put F sub 1, but I just mean F of F of C1, E1 equal to C1. That's going to be a linear functional on Z, trivially, okay? <laughs> okay. All right, so what do we have? We have 
let's double check that, that F is less than or equal to P on Z. Okay? Then we have F of C1, E1 equals C1, which is less than or equal to the value of C1, which is equal to the norm of C1, E1. Okay? Equals P of C1, E1. Okay? So it's trivial that F is less than or equal to P. So F of X is less than or equal to P of X for X belonging to Z. If I had taken F of C1, E1 equal to 2 C1, it wouldn't have been. Okay? Of course, then I could have taken a different sublinear function. I would have taken 2 times the norm of X. Okay? So any scalar multiple of this P here would also be another valid P, okay? So, just pointing out. So, I've, I've got this really simple case. Now, what are the possible extensions? What are the possible extensions of F? The extension is not unique, as you're going to see. There exists one, but need not be unique in any way. Oops, I just erased all this stuff that I'm going to need. Uh-oh. I better leave that up. See, I can still see it. P of Y plus Y1. <laughs> That's the advantage this time. Okay. Um, at 3, I had minus P minus Z minus Y1 minus F tilde of Z. Last three we'll see. Okay. Okay, I just leave those up so that you won't get lost when I start writing things down. I'm just going to follow exactly this last step of the proof and figure out what values of C would be possible and what kind of things would be possible. So um, we follow the construction of G1 to see how to extend F to, let's say, just Z1 equals the span of E1 and E2. Let's just go one step. Let's just add one more vector, okay, to, that's not in Z. Take the span of Z in that vector, Z1, okay? We want G1 of C1 plus E1 plus C2 plus E2, excuse me, times E2. We want that to be less than or equal to C1. No, equal to. We want this equal. This is how we did it. Plus C2 times C for some constant C. All right. This is exactly what we did. Instead of calling it alpha, I'm calling it C2 because it's just the next coordinate. All right. So C2 is playing the role of alpha. And what do we want? And I, and I want two things. I want to put two and three together. I'm just going to put the C in the middle. Okay. And we want uh, C less than or equal to what? We want it to less than or equal to P of C1, E1 plus, the, the new Y1 is the E2, okay, minus F tilde of C1, E1 was C1. I'm sorry, was there a, yeah. Is there a minus sign here? I think it was. Yeah, that was a minus sign. So maybe we got another mistake in the notes. It won't matter. Okay, there's some fudging around. But it's not going to make, make any difference when I get to it. Okay, minus this, and I need it greater than or equal to minus P of minus A to 1, E1, minus E2, minus A to 1. Okay, where well I've taken a, Z equal to uh, 
or Z now is playing. Y is the is the C one E one and Z is eta one E one. Okay, those are my vectors in the original domain. Okay, so I want this. This is what it actually boils down to if I take two and three together. Hopefully I got those two and three written right. Don't want to make any mistakes at this point, otherwise you'll kill me. Okay. <laughs> all right, so I want that. That looks right, and that's almost right on my page. For all C1 and A to 1. In R. This is what I need. So what C is going to be valid? Let's just write this down, because I know what the norm of this thing is, right? This is the norm. So I want minus the norm of, let's just write it down, minus a to 1, comma minus 1, comma 0, 0, 0, okay, <laughs> okay. Minus a to 1, less than or equal to c, less than or equal to the norm of c1, comma 1, comma 0, 0, 0, minus c1. So let's write that down a little bit more. I can evaluate the norm. That's simply minus the absolute value of eta 1 plus 1 minus eta 1 less than or equal to c less than or equal to the absolute value of c1 plus 1 minus c1. Okay, for all eta 1 and c1 in the real numbers. Well, now I have to think about what this, boil, what this condition boils down to. Not too hard, though. <laughs> okay. If a to 1 is negative, then these things just can't, the, the minus the absolute value is a negative number, but then the minus the a to 1 is a positive number, so these will cancel each other off, and you simply get a minus 1 here. And so that's the most stringent condition. Otherwise, um, it can be more negative than that. Okay, if a to one was positive, then I get something like minus one minus two a to one. But I want to take the more stringent of the cases, so I want to take a to one negative, and so that's going to give me negative one less than or equal to c. And if I take here c one positive, then that's going to give me the most stringent condition. Okay, less than or equal to one. That's it. So any C between minus 1 and 1 does the job. And so what I have is that, um, so that means that I have G1 of C1, E1 plus C2, E2 equals C1 plus C, C, C2. All right, with C between minus 1 and 1. So what do you think the general extension would be then? After that, you would just continue to add things. Uh, it's kind of expected anyway that any uh, you'd have to work a little bit more, but I, th I believe that the the general extension would be f. So f tilde of c1, c2, and so on. Uh, yeah equal to C1 plus C2, C2, plus C3, C3, plus, and so on. Okay, keep going. For all, uh, for all C2 in absolute value, C3 in absolute value, etc., less than or equal to 1, linearly extends to all of L1, real L1, okay, with uh, F tilde of X less than equal to P of X for all X and real L1, okay? Well, that's kind of obvious in the beginning, but we just want to double check that these conditions you might say, well, where'd you come up with that? <laughs> okay. All right. <laughs> but now you can guess the answer. All right. And you wouldn't be able to take any of the C, the little C's 
the C2, the C3, or whatever, not the C, but the, the little C, the coefficients, you wouldn't be able to take any of these bigger than one in absolute value. Otherwise, uh, by appropriate choice of x, you would this, this inequality would fail. Right? If I took one of the, if I took, for example, uh, yeah. Well, okay. It's not too hard to see because the norm is so simple here. All right, so the answer is not unique. Any of these will extend. Is it clear that that is a good, uh, well-defined linear functional? Okay, by absolute convergence of series. This is certainly an absolutely convergent thing. The sum, as long as the norm is, of x is finite. Okay. All right. There's a problem 4.2.10 that might be of some interest. Um, just to see how you might apply this this theorem 4.2.10. Let's get into the problems just a little bit and see what other kind of things you can mess you mess your mind with. It says <laughs> in this problem. So we'll come back to this this example when we get to the next statement of the Hahn-Bonnach theorem. And we're just going to keep going for the next section and just prove two more versions of the theorem. Okay, one for complex vector spaces, so we need to extend it. And the only thing is, is just instead of a sublinear function, we're going to have a semi-norm. Okay, so we're going to generalize this slightly, okay, to get the complex case. But let's, before we leave the real case, let's look at problem 4.2.10. It says, let P be a sublinear functional as it was in this theorem we just proved on a real vector space X, so same context. Show that there exists a linear functional, F tilde on X. X real in a product space? P given. P sublinear function on x and then show that there exists a linear function of f tilde linear functional on x such that minus p of minus x less than or equal to f tilde of x less than or equal to p of x for all x and x. So just show there's some linear functional running around. <laughs> so there's no little f given. No little f is given. So what little f should I do? No, first, part of the problem is trivial. This lower inequality, I claim, follows from the upper inequality. First, let's see if we all agree to this solution. First, if I have um, tilde of x less or equal to p of x for all x in x. And x is a vector space implies that of course f tilde of minus x is less or equal to p of minus x. Okay? Which is equivalent to okay well that's actually if and only if. Okay for all x because is it your vector space, right? 
I can put it in but let's just think about in particular implication, all right? So we don't get confused. If and only if, let's now pull the minus sign out of the f tilde because it's linear, so minus f tilde of x, let's remove the p of minus x, and now put the minus sign through. That changes the inequality, right? That's our rule of, so that if and only if f tilde of x is greater than or equal to minus p of minus x. So the lower inequality falls for free. Okay. So I need only establish the upper inequality. How can I do that? Therefore, I need only establish there exists f tilde of x with f tilde of x less than or equal to p of x for all x and x. What else do I know about a sublinear functional? I know that p of 0 is 0 because by positive homogeneity I had to have alpha, what is it, is p of x plus y is less than or equal to p of x plus p of y, That's the def this is the first statement in the definition of a sublinear function. The other one is if alpha is greater than or equal to 0 then uh, alpha p of x is equal to p of alpha x. Okay. So the second statement gives me that if I take alpha equal to zero, which is allowed in that definition, then I get zero equal to p of zero. So I'll note that p of zero is equal to zero. So does that give you any hint? How could I now set up the existence of this f tilde by the Hunt Bonnet theorem I just proved? I need to give myself an f little f to extend, little f and a capital Z, what should I take for my little f and my capital Z? Something really, 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 really simple. <laughs> What's the simplest linear functional you can think of? Very good. And what's the simplest vector space you can think of? Zero. <laughs> Okay, so I'm going to take f from 0 to r by f of 0 equal to 0. That satisfies f of 0 equal to 0, which is equal to p of 0. So in particular, you have less than or equal to, right? So f of, f of x, so f of x is less than or equal to p of x for all x in z equal to 0 the zero thing. Therefore, by the Hanbonic theorem, I can extend f to all of capital X with f tilde. I guess this is algebraic, cysts, you know, good problem. You know, there's nothing to do except pick the right example. <laughs> Therefore, uh, by 4, 2, 1, there exists f tilde on all of x to r, linear functional. So that f tilde of x is less than or equal to p of x for all x in uh, x. And there's not anything else to say about extending little f because it trivially extends. Any linear functional has to extend little f equal to zero on the zero subspace. So starting from nothing, you get the whole thing, that there at least exists one. Okay? That's for kind of the immediate corollary. All right. Um, of course, this is trivial also that, um, let's see, so, but I guess, let's see now, is it trivial now? Because P, my, this is a negative number, so actually, so what is the answer? It's not very interesting that there exists one, because what, was, what will always work? Zero. Zero will always work, unfortunately. So this is not so interesting, unfortunately. 
So that's why I didn't assign this problem. <laughs> they should really have a non-trivial one. But uh, there's nothing they can do. You can't fix the problem in some sense. Okay, so we'll just skip it. Okay? How, you know, is there any way to make it better? Um, you, you have to start with something non-trivial. Since P is, well, actually, no. P of zero is zero. No, that's not right. Because P doesn't have to be, let's see, does P have to be non-negative? Yeah, P has to be non-negative. So P has to be non-negative. So this is a trivial thing to do for the zero. P is a non-negative function. P, P of, we already mentioned that before. Actually, it was in the definition, but it actually um, falls from the, uh, no, it didn't fall from the definition in this case. So P was not negative also. It was part of the uh, definition of a sublinear functional, I believe. On page uh, 9, no, did it say that? Wait a second. A real valued functional P didn't say it was non-negative. Uh, wait a second. So maybe this is non-trivial. If it doesn't have to be non-negative, this is non-trivial because the sublinear function doesn't have to be non-negative. So I need to find an example of a sublinear function that's not non-negative. Then this is non-trivial. So can there exist a sublinear function that's non-negative? This is not in the assumption. Okay. So. Who gives me an example? Sublinear function is not non negative. I think um, just a linear functional is a, is a sublinear functional, right? Any, so so, you, so the question is how these sublinear functions, are they very rich or not? Can you have, can you have some more not interesting sublinear functionals um, that are not necessarily uh, negative? For example, can I have C1 plus, um, or 2C1 plus C2 or something? Is that sublinear? Okay. On L1. If I take F. Can I take P of C1, C2? That's yeah, certainly not um, not positive, okay? Because I can have the negative number coming from the C, right? So yeah, I think this is a, this is a it is a non-trivial result, I believe, because then this is sublinear, is it not? Obviously, the, any, the linearity here and the sublinearity there, okay? If I add two things, okay, non-trivial, let's just say this. I need to check, all right? So I got you into this business, okay? So you've got this. Define it this way. Then this one is 2C1 plus eta 1 plus the absolute value of C2 plus eta 2, which is clearly less than or equal to P of C1, C2, and so on, plus P of eta 1, eta 2, and so on. Okay, by the triangle inequality. Okay, you got equality on this piece and then inequality by the triangle inequality. And you also have, obviously, the positive homogeneity. P of, if I take a positive number alpha, alpha greater than or equal to zero, I take alpha C1, alpha C2, and so on, then that's equal to two alpha C1 plus alpha C2 equals alpha times two C1 plus C2, okay? So it is positive homogeneous, okay? So apply that one, and then what you're saying is that uh, 
then f of x is it still trivial then? <laughs> f of x is still between those two numbers. I guess it's still maybe. Uh, so then it's just saying. Uh, I don't know what's going on here. What's the definition? Does that have to be a non-negative function? Sublinear. All right, we better skip this for now. Let's come back and have a look at it a little bit more. Sublinear functional. Okay. So, if it's less or equal to this, then automatically it's greater than or equal to this. So what does it mean if p is negative? Oh, I see. If p is negative, then p of minus x in this case is going to be... Um, p of negative is going to be a positive number, so that's going to be a negative number. So I can have... That'll be positive, so I'm going to have between two negative numbers. Right? If I take C1 equal to minus 1, okay, and C2 equal to 1, let's say, okay, in that example over there, then I get the P is negative 1, right? Minus 2 plus 1, okay, what's the P of the negative X? The negative X, the P will be plus 1. Right? So I'll have minus 1 less or equal to f tilde less than or equal to minus 1 at that point. So that I have to f tilde equal to minus 1 at that point. Okay? So it's non trivial. Okay. Minus p of minus uh, minus uh, plus one less than or equal to uh, f tilde of x less than or equal to uh, minus two plus one equals minus one. This is a minus uh, a, a if I put the negative in, it's two. I'm sorry. Oh, it's got to be between minus three. If I put the minus x in, what do we, what do we get? If I get a minus one and a plus one, this has been a plus, and that's plus, so it's minus three. Let's equal to this. Let's equal to that. Okay, not minus one. So I get minus three. Let's equal f tilde of x. Let's equal to minus one. Okay? <clears throat> that's better, not minus one. Okay. So it's a real problem. Okay. <laughs> Finally, done with this. The so sublinear functions do not have to be not negative. The semi-norm is going to be a not negative, and that's going to be the next theorem. So now what we're going to do is at least state the next theorem. Took forever. This is why we have an extra week before spring break. Okay. Um, and now that we're going to take, well, first we're going to only do the vector space version. And then we're going to do, let me skate the next one after that. This is not very hard to prove. Okay. Um, this is quite easy. So 4, 3, 1, it's an easy check. I may skip this, the proof of this, uh, after a little playing around. So this is hahn bonnach theorem for complex vector space, for real or complex vector space. The com complexity means I simply have to increase the assumptions a little bit, okay? So on this, I require let um, x be real or complex, vector space, and let's take uh, P is now going to be a semi-norm, so-called. P of x plus y less or equal to, I don't know why they don't call it that here, but we do have the terminology on page 71 in one of the problems, and you can verify that it is exactly those conditions um, of a semi-norm. In fact, I think in one of the homework problems is to verify that indeed this, the conditions I'm going to write down are just the conditions of a semi-norm. Well, it means it's a norm, Except 
P x equal to zero, so, except for the condition that P x equal to zero does not imply x equal to zero. P of x plus equal to P of x plus P of y, and al P of alpha x equals the absolute value of alpha P of x for all scalars. Okay? So as the scaling, let P be like this. This automatically implies that P is not negative in this case. In this case, because I can put alpha equal to minus 1. Alpha equal to minus 1 if I take n2 implies by 1, implies by 1 that, that well, 0 equals P of x minus x because P of 0 is 0 by 2. It's trivial, okay? Is less than the P of x plus P of minus x, but P of minus x is equal to P of x. So you get p of x plus p of x. So then you get p of x is two equals two p of x. So this time p of x is greater than equal to zero. All right. So the full scaling gives you on that negative function. Okay. <clears throat> Then under this condition, um, you get and assume now the absolute value instead is less than equal to p of x for x and z for some linear functional f mapping z okay on z which is a subspace of x, okay, subspace of x, then there is a linear extension to all of x. Of f, extension f tilde of f to all of x. In other words, it says from z to x is the terminology is using. There's a list, exists a linear extension f tilde from z to x. I should write it that way so you'll follow the book. From z to x. So that. And I take the absolute value of f tilde of x. I get that plus or the p of x for all x in my vector space, real or complex in this case now. So it follows immediately from the real case by a little playing around. You have to do the, you have to check the absolute value sign works, okay? If you put in the uh, two, if you assume two, then the absolute value works. Uh, let's check the real case from four, two, one. Okay, by 4, 2, 1, obviously, you would assume this, okay, assume 1, and so that then I get 2, all right? If I assume 1, then obviously that means in the real case that, that f of x is also equal to p of x, okay, if the absolute value is less. By 1, you get that this implies that f of x is less than the p of x for x and z. But also, p of x is sublinear, okay? In particular, the semi-norm is sublinear. This is a semi-norm. Page 71, compare page 71, and also compare one of your homework problems. Four point three point one. Okay. 
by 1, this implies f for x and z. So by 4.2-1, there exists f tilde so that f tilde of x is less or equal to p of x for x in x. Okay? And there you have that. So now, therefore, as before, f tilde of minus f tilde of x equals f tilde of minus x, which is less than or equal to p of minus x. Okay, but that's equal to p of x now. Okay, in the seminorm case, like seminorm, and I should have called this a different two. <laughs> Let's call this little little one and little double one. Okay. <laughs> okay. Ah, it's too late. Okay. Well, call this one uh, prime and this two prime then. Okay, one prime. Okay? So by semi norm. I use the double numbering. Okay. Over there. So therefore, um, f tilde of x is less is on the one hand it's greater than or equal to minus p of x, on the other hand it's less than or equal to p of x. So I get the up, you get the lower bound, so therefore I get the absolute value of f tilde of x is less than or equal to p of x. Okay, now now about the complex case. The complex case, um, I'll make some comments about it next time I guess. You basically say that uh, if f is complex valued, then write it as, in terms of its real and imaginary parts. You can always write a linear functional. If there's a complex valued linear functional, is f1 plus i f2, where f1 will be a real linear functional, f2 will be a real linear functional. They'll both be linear functionals. f1 will be real linear functional, f2, but you can have the complex argument, obvious. I mean, you can have complex scalars in there, so they'll still respect. Um, that. So what's going to happen? Okay. Well, well, actually, they'll, have, they'll in particular they'll respect real scalars. So you have to then check to see exactly what's going to happen in terms of the complex number i. So then you simply write it down, and it works. Okay. You have to apply. Um, you have to consider uh, if you got the subspace Z, first you consider it as a real subspace. So if you have any uh, uh, subspace in a complex vector space, Z, you can, you can regard X itself as a real vector space. Even if, it had, even if you had just basically uh, complex matrices, that would be a vector space over the complex numbers. Okay, you can still have the complex matrices, but now take the real scalars, multiply by real scalar. Take linear combinations with reals. It's still a real vector space. So any complex vector space can be regarded also as a real vector space. That, you have to play that game and then apply the Han Bonnach theorem from the previous case appropriately. So it's gonna, it'll fall with sufficient amount of massaging. Okay? <laughs> okay. That's one of those terminology. So by just sort of seeing what happens, by playing around with it, it will eventually come out. But it, since the computation was so complicated, and you had a slightly weaker condition on the sublinearity from the previous theorem, that's why I divided it in two cases. Then what you do is you say, now let's take, uh, I want a bounded linear functional. Okay? I want to consider the case of bounded linear functionals. So that's the final version of Hanbonic theorem, which would have most of the application. And that's 4.3-2. So that'd be a bounded linear functional on a subspace of a norm space. So you now take a norm space instead of just a vector space. And now it can be real or complex. We've handled the complex case in sufficient detail. And now, um, then you can extend the bounded linear functional to uh, a linear functional having the same exact norm. Okay. 
And that's the whole statement. You can extend it to the linear function. It has the same norm. Okay? And so what you're going to take for your p function, you're going to take basically for your p function in that application, essentially the norm. It's just a scalar positive scalar multiple of the norm in the space. Okay? So you move, you're taking p the most general to, to not as general as a sublinear case to to the sublinear case, to the semi-norm, to the norm. That's what's happening to the p. And then you're getting the Hanvonic theorem in those three cases. <laughs> okay. So we'll we'll finish that. The set. We'll we'll do the little playing around that is required to get the the complex version, and then we'll the application. Then the final application is quite simple. Almost done with that. Okay. So, any more questions about your test? Any final last words? Is the latest we would be able to email you and expect a response before the test is due? Like, I'm thinking over the weekend, possibly. Um, check your emails. Like, oh, okay. Um, it's just that if I make any real, you know, public statements that are that are public that people would want to have for public digestion, then uh, there's no other time. So I'll give, you know, minor hints, perhaps. You know, like clarifications of the problems. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Clarifications of the problem. And we would just do an email list? If you want to. If you want to. If you want to see whatever I say to somebody else or somebody emails, we can do that. Um, do we you want to write a piece of paper out there real quick and then make sure everybody's getting it? I don't know about Popovich and Matt, but I guess uh, they're not here. There's two other students who are not here. There's another student that we don't know, besides like Matt. Popovich, Michael Popovich. Have you ever met him? You met him before. He's in the class too. Yeah.